Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Renee Green, Director of Art, Culture, and Technology, ACT and MIT, and I'm happy to welcome you to the ACT lecture series, uh, the focus uh, of which is cinematic migrations. This is a project that's taking place uh, during a, a two-year period. Uh, now we're in the third semester uh, of the project, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome this evening Tarek El Haik. Uh, he's come from San Francisco, uh, and um, I'm very glad that he was able to make it. Uh, Tarek El Haik is a media anthropologist, film curator, and assistant professor of media and technology at San Francisco State University. His work is informed by archival research on Mexican and Latin American avant-garde film and experimental media arts and the ethnography of curatorial laboratories in Mexico City. He has curated several experimental film programs from Latin America and the Arab world at the Pacific Film Archive, uh, the Ruhr Triennale, San Francisco Cinematheque, Tangier Cinematheque, uh, Rice University, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. His writings have appeared in books and journals, including Framework, Revista de Antropología Social, and uh, Critical Arts. He is currently completing a manuscript titled Incurable Image, Untimely Futures, Lessons from Mexico. I'm very curious to learn about uh, the, uh, what uh, Professor El Haik refers to as the proliferation of medial acts deployed under the banner of the social. Uh, it is in fact still unclear, um, he says, how social media and art practices have emerged as the dominant creative horizons for resisting neoliberal forms of mediation. Uh, in particular, he cites uh, the malaise of contemporary curatorial and moving image culture, uh, offering another use of Deleuze's notes on societies of control. So uh, without any further introduction, I welcome uh, Tarek El Haik uh, to ACT. Welcome. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank Rene for um, the invitation to uh, the opportunity to share with you my work. Um, um, this is an opportunity to also get some feedback on a book manuscript that I recently completed and then I'm about to submit. So this is going to be just timely and not as untimely as the images that I will be talking about. Uh, I would like to thank also the uh, team at ACT for all of their warm welcome and, uh, and help uh, with all of the technical uh, difficulties that we had earlier on. So it's ready to go. And, um, but before I get into the material itself, um, This is a, some material that I will be presenting tonight that is um, derived from a, uh, an ethnography of curatorial groups in Mexico City where I conducted research for uh, two years. Um, this is a project that, as in many ethnographies, begins with a particular direction and orientation and ends up taking another one. Um, I initially uh, was doing and conducting ar archival research in the Filmoteca and La Cineteca, um, the National Film Archive and the um, Film Archive of the University of Mexico City on um, Eisenstein's um, major project of 1931, Que Viva Mexico, um, that was incomplete and unfinished. And I was interested in the leg legacy of the very particular kind of nationalist and cosmopolitan iconography and nationalist aesthetics that Eisenstein had bequeathed upon uh, uh, many generations of filmmakers who uh, had to address the uh, very specific uh, visual culture that he uh, attempted to transmit in collaboration with his Mexican friends, uh, from Diego Rivera to 
uh, Siqueiros and Frida Kahlo and the whole group of avant-gardists who uh, were very much enmeshed in the uh, political and, vid and, and intellectual and visual culture of the 1920s and 30s. So I will not be presenting this material today. Today I wanted to really share with you a process of how a concept, namely the incurable image, comes to life and becomes fabricated. Uh, so it's, my talk today is more about what is it that the incurable image is? What is the incurable as a concept and what kind of concept is the incurable image? So uh, with this in mind, uh, I will uh, start. So in the midst of Gilles Deleuze's societies of control, one can begin to draw the contours of a shift towards clinically and ethically inflected forms of curation and symptomatologies of the moving image. From Georges Didier Huberman's surviving image to Patricia Pister's neuro image to Jacques Rancière's the intolerable image, from Documenta's commissioning of Javier Teyes's Artos Cave or Pedro Reyes' makeshift clinic consultorio to the Mexico City-based curatorial collectives Laboratorio Sesenta or the pioneering collectives such as Curare or Teratoma, one can begin to sense the contours of a generalized malaise in contemporary media and visual culture. At first sight, this curatorial and intermedial diagnostic would seem to return us, or at least remind us, of concerns related to disciplinary societies, visual culture, and social formations. Indeed, these diagnostics would seem to be the sign, as it were, of the current intensification of creative acts mobilized in the name of so-called social art, documentary practices, and the ethnographic turn in contemporary art a sign of a prescriptive form of the image that would cure the maladies of capitalist visual and media cultures. Yet, if we turn the gaze upon itself to interrogate itself as the task of critique would want us to, the symptomatologies would begin to whisper to us something else, another orientation and set of demands, one for which the stakes seem to be nothing less than the future brewing in contemporary images. Two queries will therefore accompany us throughout this talk tonight. How did socially oriented curatorial intermedia and moving image practices emerge as the dominant creative and prescriptive horizons for resisting contemporary forms of biopolitical administration and mediation, i.e. humanist so-called affirmative biopolitics in the face of Thanatopolitics politics and the capitalist dead drive? How does the contemporary image harbor instead another form of care, an image of thought, a form of care for a future and more from traditional vitalist and organicist social formations, in which complex articulations of death and life present us with an image of the incurable as a complex assemblage of human and non-human forces. So building on my ethnography of curatorial collectives in Mexico City, I will examine some of these contemporary images that con con conceptualize the latter as a form of life that harbors and struggles with a futurist mode of care. And the concept of care is going to be something we'll be talking about. This is to say that the contemporary image will be conceived as a future-oriented aggregate of display, projection, politics, but also of ethics. In light of this ontology, the contemporary image appears as a technology for an ethics of imminence and as a new weapon that enables us to endure, work through, and take pleasure amidst our societies of control. The screen is dark. Our nervous system encounters its surface from an intimate distance that communicates to us an indiscernible oral pattern. We hear an alchemic mix of emulsion, scratches, and footsteps on the pavement, reminiscent of military troop marching in unison, perhaps performing a routine exercise, perhaps mobilizing for war. There is no reassuring match between the sound of the disciplined boots and an image that would confirm our projection or placate our mounting anxiety. We are perhaps being recruited for a collective ritual or are haunted by a militaristic performance. Within few minutes, the steps gently fade and we gradually begin to discern the contours of an uncanny clinical scene. Dimly lit drains and tubes connect on the upper side of the frame to what appears like the contours of a bottle-shaped life support system, vertically extending a long plastic cord across the frame. The movement of the camera follows the gravity of the liquid being inoculated and reaches the bottom of the frame, plunged in darkness. It connects to an unidentifiable, I can never pronounce this word. It connects to an non-identifiable and immobile diseased form of life, yet an organic body is nowhere to be seen. 
A connection between something ailing out there and the makeshift medical equipment is never established. It remained concealed, as it were, under the thick shadowy world partially situated in the, in the extreme lower side of the frame, below the frame, portion, as it were. Musical notes emanating from a flute replace the footsteps, rise up, and are refracted towards our ears in a strange perpendicular motion, reaching us, as it were, from the underworld. Our eyes are poorly equipped and vainly compensate for the invisibility of the scene, following faithfully and hypnotically the leader, the camera movement, always in the same direction, reaching further down to connect the tube with its diseased source. We are no longer spectators who merely hear and see. We are patients immersed in this medical dispositif, overcome by an illness, the etiology of which remains opaque to our intrusive clinical gaze, but of which these images, sounds, and camera movements appear nonetheless to be the symptoms. As the camera slowly proceeds downward, it reaches the lower part of the frame. A brief, silent, and dark interval is opened for a fraction of a second. Out of nowhere enters an intense and fast-paced shadow of a, lar of a large buzzard and vulture, spectrally hovering over the Tsokalo, the nationalist public square par, par excellence. The scene is now submerged in Baroque orchestral music. The vulture's shadow ominously glides and surveys the area demarcated by the Baroque architectural cardinal points of the square, the historical seat of the Mexican executive and legislative branches and Catholic church. The dots begin to connect and metonymic contiguities enigmatically held apart by montage turn the scene into metaphor. The footsteps hint at a flag ceremony one of, the, uh, one of the grandiose rituals of the nation taking place daily on the Plaza de la Constitución. The drain was of a Coca-Cola Coca bottle, symbol of cultural imperialism, connected with equal symbolic force to the square. But the seeming metaphor immediately disintegrates. The buzzard is not exactly the eagle on the Mexican flag clinching its claws on a serpent on a nopal cactus, but the scavenger so piloted that surveys what now begins to feel like an autopsy scene or at least an emergency or terminal situation. A zone of indistinction is created in our minds. The expectation of a life support system sustaining the national body politic turns into its double. The autopsy of a corpse, its uncanny double. Credit appears on the screen with the Gothic typography amplifying the thematics of death and prolonging the serial five minute long opening sequence. We are at the Filmoteca, we are at the Filmoteca San Indelfonso, screening facility and research center, located in Mexico City Centro, Hist Centro Historico, only a few blocks from the Socalo. I am alone in a small theater watching for the first time La Formula Secreta, the 1965 essay film and coup de grace by Mexican director Ruben Gámez. <laughs> 
So Rafael Lozano Hammer, uh, who's well known for his um, large scale public installations, um, invited a, um, in, in 2008 uh, for the commemoration of the 1968 massacres of students uh, in uh, Tlatelolco Plaza in Mexico City, uh, uh, Rafael Lozano Hammer created a very interesting dispositive to think about uh, this uh, major incurable image of recent uh, uh, political history in Mexico. Um, the dispositive is very interesting and I think definitely addresses some of the themes raised by cinematic migrations. Um, the dispositive was uh, uh, erected in such a way that a microphone uh, was placed in the middle of the plaza in which passers-by, which included um, everyday workers, um, passers-by, intellectuals that who were invited to speak through the microphone, um, um, syndicalists, uh, union workers, uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, of people were invited to uh, express their sense of grief uh, or uh, memory uh, about the uh, event uh, that took place 40 years earlier. Uh, so, Bos Alta um, resulted in a very interesting, I think, uh, use of uh, uh, the sensorium uh, in such a way that the voices of all of the passersby who were invited to talk uh, were conver converted into search lights. So there's a very interesting process of uh, transfiguration of uh, grief and mourning through a um, process that created a zone of contact between the cinematic apparatus but also between the political apparatus of the city itself and creating a conversation about uh, the uh, massacres of 1968. Uh, I would like to show very briefly uh, uh, some uh, uh, segments from, from the piece, um, and then we will proceed. que transmite desde la ciudad universitaria en la capital de México. Voz alta. Instalación radiofónica y visual interactiva para Tlatelolco. Del artista Rafael Lozano Hemer. Radio UNAM. Desde la Plaza de las Tres Culturas. En Tlatelolco. Documenta 68. Fragmentos de una historia colectiva. Carlos Monsiváis. Me, me toca ver el principio en Juárez y eran realmente represivos. ¿eh? No, no menosprecio a lo que puedan hacer ahora las fuerzas del orden, pero entonces aquello eran judiciales, policías y quién sabe quién, para policías o, o para militares. Se van los estudiantes a, al Zócalo y se crea algo que todavía no me explico. Surge ahí el movimiento como una decisión de que no nos van a reprimir. Y de pronto están las piedras, desde luego al día siguiente me entero que todas las llevó el Kremlin, están las piedras que empiezan a, a tirarle a los ganaderos, hay, no hay muertos ahí ni, ni heridos graves, pero sí contusiones. Y, y se da la quema de camiones y ya después eh, empieza a surgir el movimiento y eh, el preámbulo claro es la decisión de resistencia. 
vida, mas no estamos enterados de los hechos o la trascendencia que tuvo. Entonces es un llamado de exhortación, tanto de los jóvenes como a los adultos, a todos aquellos que les interesa su libertad y vivir en un país con democracia, pues que hagamos conciencia y no nos conformemos con lo que nos dan. Eso es todo. Gracias. Fui partícipe en 1968 que desde la azotea de mi casa podía ver las rafa, ráfagas que desde aquí se emitían. Alcancé a oír todo el tiroteo. Sabíamos que algo grave pasaba aquí, pero rebasó lo que nosotros pensábamos. Mi nombre es Marcos Sánchez García. Soy trabajador del Seguro Social. Yo pregunté alguna vez por qué solamente esos nombres en esa lápida me contestaron que fueron solamente los cuerpos, o sea, las personas que lograron reconocer. Hubo muchísimos que no lograron identificar, pero que hoy están presentes en nuestra memoria, en este acto tan importante que estamos realizando. Buenas noches. Este, yo soy Guadalupe Tinoco, soy este, vecina de aquí de Tlatelolco. Este, yo no entiendo por qué si este, hay culpables, no hay castigo. Y los estudiantes eh, no contaron con la ayuda de la iglesia, no sé por qué permitieron que la iglesia estuviera abierta el día de ayer. O sea, yo no digo que la iglesia tenía que haber estado cerrada, así como le cerró la puerta, tenía que haber estado. Muchas gracias. Recuerdo que participé en todas las marchas y casualmente en, en la reunión que se iba a efectuar aquí el 2 de octubre, casualmente no me dieron permiso en mi casa de, de venir y no sé, a lo mejor por eso estoy ahorita participando de mi experiencia. Me emociona bastante esta, esta situación y, y no sé, Actualmente estamos viendo que es necesario que sigamos eh, luchando, participando y, y, no, y no cejar en esta, en esta lucha. Les agradezco la oportunidad que me dieron de escucharlos. Gracias. So, this is the moment where I shift into a different mode. Okay. So one of the questions here that I that I'm trying to to raise, um, the question of curation and the question of curators and the political economy of curation is something that has um, kept me busy for the past years. And the idea of the incurable, which I will be talking about, came as a response to the very etymology of the word curating and curation. So, for, I mean, this is just a very quick uh, summary. Curation, care, cura, uh, priest, uh, cure, but also incurable. So the concept of the incurable to me was initially generated after the first screening of La Formula Secreta, which I attended in Mexico City, ne near the Zocalo in the, uh, in the um, San Ildefonso Research Center. I was very much intrigued by the, um, by the medical or the clinical dispositive of the opening sequence. And the project, which was initially going to be about experimental film and avant-garde cinema in Mexico, completely turned my attention towards uh, 
this particular kind of clinical dimension in experimental media arts in Mexico. The question of the incurable is a, is a tricky one. Uh, incurable is meant both in the literal sense of uh, incurable, in the sense that something that is condemned not to be cured, but it's also meant here in the sense of what cannot be curated in the professional sense of the term. Why are these particular cinematic dispositives, as in the case of Ruben Gámez, but also the installation dispositive of um, Rafael Lozano Hammer, and the image that you are seeing here, which is the image that is used in all of the uh, documents that introduce the work of the curatorial group Laboratorio Sesenta. Sesenta is the uh, emergency number. It's the, four one, it's the 911 number that you dial in Mexico City. So I began to be become a little bit intrigued by this repetition of a certain kind of clinical dimension or a clinical register of curating itself. An interest in a medical dispositive in a cinematic experimental film, specifically La, uh, Ruben Gamez La Formula Secreta, started to converge with other uh, curatorial forms of reflection that were taking place. And it was very interesting for me to also note that most of these curatorial laboratories were consistently composed of art historians, artists, but also anthropologists. And I began to raise the question, why is this particular kind of assemblage of professionals gathering around this particular kind of uh, clinical register? And the clinical register to me became intriguing because it seemed to be enacting a form of repetition that, um, that um, uh, most of these curators and, and artists uh, relied on to make their particular kind of intervention. So the relationship here between the historical moment of 1965, 1968, the 1960s in Mexico, and the contemporary moment, there were some sort of correspondences that I was interested in exploring, not as a historian, but as an anthropologist. So I began to have a series of conversations with this curatorial collective or curatorial laboratory or curatorial groups, it depends which, which, which group re refer to their own practice in through a very particular kind of uh, specific term. Some prefer laboratory, others prefer group, others prefer collectives, depending on the kind of political inclinations. But consistently, I began to ask the questions, what do these images want? W what kind of malaise, what kind of um, 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 set of illnesses, if you will, metaphorical but also very much um, historical, were um, being addressed by these curators. So the curatorial, once you shift the curatorial register from the critical register to the clinical register or to the medical register, you begin to uh, enter into this uh, you know, a very interesting convergence that Gilles Deleuze calls in his uh, essays critical and clinical, the convergence of the critical and the clinical. Is this because the critical categories that we rely on are tired and we need to rely on other registers? And why do these images convey to us a sense of malaise that asks from us to rely on categories that are not necessarily critical categories? Why this, um, this, this insistence on the clinical? So this insistence or the persistence of the clinical as a way of looking at Mexican visual culture and media culture to me became a way of understanding that uh, the very notion of societies of control that Gilles Deleuze had talked about, perhaps too hastily, was not merely a shift from disciplinary societies with their spaces of confinement, the, the hospital, the prison, the university, towards a, what Deleuze calls societies of control in which we are embedded in continuous open circulation in which all of the disciplinary institutions were bound to disappear. It is this modulation of the disciplinary and the control that became very interesting to me in the specific context of Mexico. So I began having conversations with these curators and I started also asking the question about what kind of artists do they rely on to also make this particular clinical understanding of curation. So what do these images ail from? What kind of uh, malady does the Mexican body politics seem to suffer from. So the incurable at that particular point began to also 
be converted into a concept and a category of repetition. If in Ruben Gamez's La Formula Secreta, the opening scene reminds us almost of what Walter Benjamin you know, famously made this analogy between the surgeon and, and the filmmaker, what, is, what are these images probing? I had two options at that point. Explore a cultural history of these particular images or try to understand exactly what is it that in these particular curatorial groups a certain kind of conceptual work was beginning to take place. So my very understanding of understanding the symptoms that these images were conveying or the symptoms that these images were ailing from asked from me to expand my understanding of symptomatology or understanding how to diagnose symptoms. And the symptomatology that I started working with was very simple. is What is the point of encounter between an anthropologist and art historian, artists and curators who are gathering and assembling this particular group of people? Of course, this was taking place in a moment where the ethnographic turn, the social turn, the documentary turn, which are not necessarily the same, but nonetheless emerge around the same time, let's say in the late 1980s all the way to today, and I think the conversation continues. What is it in ethnography? What is it in the, in the documentary form itself? What is it in the social that these curators are trying to diagnose and perhaps cure? Or is it perhaps a limit to their own practice? Is it perhaps a way of exhibiting a certain kind of limit in curatorial practice itself. So a project that began about images of avant-garde and experimental cinema were, initial, were quickly converted into images about how do these images curate themselves, but how also these images began the starting point or the point of departure for a whole ethical inquiry into the visual and media, media culture of contemporary Mexico. The images, of course, became um, uh, as in this case, for example, the images of a, it's, it's a detail of a, a police patrol car in Mexico City. Emergency. La Formula Secreta begins also with the very particular kind of scene. The tubes, the drains, the vulture, the body that is about to, to die, an autopsy. Something is happening in these particular images, and they are repeated for reasons that are still obscure to many of us. So rather than equating the very totemic understanding of Mexico as a country that has conquered or tamed uh, death itself, I mean, that's one of the classic nationalist tropes that in Mexico has been dominant since the 1920s from the period of the avant-garde onward. The question here is not specifically, is this a Mexican-specific problem? I think this is a problem that is uh, of which the whole curatorial economy ails to a certain extent. It is also not by accident that in uh, uh, the last documenta, or let's, let's start with this one too. This is a very important seminar that took place in uh, Mexico City, or in Puebla, uh, in, in uh, 2003. This was the second symposium of contemporary art. And the subtitle of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the symposium is Del Malestar and de la Curaduria, Malaise in Curation. And as you can see very easily, this is a poor image. You have a band-aid that covers the image. Again, what is happening in this particular image? Are curators becoming new surgeons? Are curators becoming our new physicians? What is the role that curators have uh, acquired over the past years? And why are curators so um, um, interested in offering antidotes to the malaise of contemporary visual culture? Of course, the connections between all of these different points is not clear, but yet the redundancy or the repetition asks from us the very simple question, are these good or bad repetitions? Or are they complex repetitions that rely on a much larger intellectual problem that we have to face conceptually? Are images, in fact, concepts? Gilles Deleuze, for example, and Guattari in their famous What is Philosophy um, understand the concept as a zone of turbulence. And I like this idea of a concept as a zone of turbulence. Here, images themselves become zones of turbulence. Here, images become concepts of sorts. And the concept that seems to be in crisis is the concept of curation itself. Have curators considered that their form of curation might be incurable? Have curators 
figure out the question of what does it mean to curate the incurable. Now, what is the incurable? The incurable might be just a form of historical repetition, a very particular question that repeats itself over time. The creation can be also what Nietzsche calls the non-historical cloud, something that escapes the historical, something that is of the order of a becoming. What, is th what are these images telling us? Or to raise the question that W.T. Mitchell has raised, what do these pictures want? What, what do they desire? Do they desire the death of the nationalist body politic? Do they require a new form of curation that cur contemporary curators do not seem to be able to attend to? Or perhaps, what form of care are curators implicated in? And if this form of care is a form of care that relies on these images as concepts, these images as zones of turbulence, what kind of authorship is at stake when curators become the dominant form of care? So the incurable here emerges not only as a manifestation of a particular kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of visual culture, a particular manifestation of, of curatorial practice itself that reaches and, and, and comes across its own limit. It comes from us, how do we cross this threshold? So this threshold, to me, is very interesting when we move to the work of the uh, Mexican anthropologist, uh, uh, artist, um, Eduardo Abaroa who recently did a very interesting, um, very interesting uh, installation at uh, the Curi Mansuto called La Destrucción Total del Museo de Antropología, The Total Destruction of the Museum of Anthropology. And in my conversations with him, we've been reflecting on the role that ethnography and anthropology has played in this particular curatorial turn. Does Eduardo Abaroa, in his desire, to destroy and explode the museum, the National Museum of Anthropology, the emblematic figure of the 1960s, the very emblematic figure, architectural figure, symbolic figure, if you will, of the 1960s, out of which Ruben Gámez uh, uh, cinema emerges. So the question here is, there is a very interesting relationship between, it, between anthropology, between the anthropologist's desire to diagnose society, between the curator who is entering into the conversation about how to diagnose uh, the particular malaise of contemporary society, and then, of course, the artist who is showing us, almost from the position of the future, what things might look like. And it would be very interesting to look at this particular image from the position of the future, looking at a museum of anthropology, the emblematic nationalist space par excellence, completely destroyed. Is this a manifestation of the dead drive? What kind of repetition, what kind of desire, what role does anthropology play in this context? Why do we refer to the um, uh, moment of the 1990s as the ethnographic turn? So my, my, my work as an anthropologist is to figure out how these different relationships exist, how are they possible, why do assemblages of anthropologists, artists, and curators converge to uh, help us think about this particular malaise? We will get back to this. In uh, recently, in um, the, the last edition of Documenta, Javier Tellez, the Venezuelan artist, was invited to uh, was invited to um, to uh, to present a work uh, that was inspired by uh, Arto's The Conquest of uh, Mexico. Arto has spent, uh, just like Eisenstein, uh, a couple of years in Mexico in 1934 and 1936, and had. Um, uh, embarked on a journey, uh, like many uh, avant-garde uh, European intellectuals of the time, to intoxicate himself with uh, indigenous native culture uh, in the hopes of uh, finding something that is profoundly and purely authentic. Javier Tellez retakes that particular text and creates an installation uh, in which a space is set up as a grotto-like cinema where the conquest of Mexico is screened, a film that Tellez made in collaboration with patients 
of the Fly Bernardino Psychiatric Hospital in Mexico City, an active psychiatric hospital in Mexico City. So this is another instance of zooming in, or perhaps catecting would be the most appropriate word, on subjects who are marked by the diacritic incurable. Psychotic patients in this particular context. So this collaboration between PES and, um, and mental patients, which is something that he's been doing for the past you know, 15 years now, is something that has caught my attention. It has caught my attention for several reasons. First, because the hospital in question is Mexico City based, and that's why that's my ethnographic site. But also, I'm interested in this obsession with the incurable. What does it mean to bring the incurable inside the, the, um, um, inside the um, you know, prestigious event like Documenta? What is the curatorial desire at work when a piece like Arto's Cave is being commissioned? So I am not interested, I'm, I'm, I'm of course interested in the piece which uh, we are going to, to, talk, to talk about shortly, but I'm interested in the curatorial desire that zooms in on that particular subject. What kind of interpolation is at work? Can we think of curation as a form of interpolation in which the incurable subject is the source of a catexis on which we zoom in? How is that particular curatorial desire performed? What kind of alliance is happening between the artist and the curator? Again. What is the limit of curation? The relationship between Ruben Gámez's La Formula Secreta and this one I is very interesting. It's an interesting one because it is of the order of a repetition that we are trying to figure out. So this particular piece, again, is it's very interesting because Fray, um, Fray, um, um, Fray Bernardino Alvarez is known to have been in the 16th century the um, first uh, criollo uh, to have um, uh, created hospitals to attend to the to, to the mentally ill um, uh, from different class and ethnic background. So he's a figure that is very much respected and perhaps one of also the quote unquote fathers of ethnopsychiatry. If you think about it, why this particular ins insistence on subject that ail from illness? So let's take a look at this particular piece, and then we will proceed with other images. And I believe that, perhaps I haven't made that clear, but these images for me, these incurable images, or this particular curatorial desires that zooms in on incurable subjects, is an effect of the ethnographic turn in many ways, or the social turn. And the distinction is a very difficult one to make, of course. But there is a malaise that is specific to the turn towards social art practices. Although I am not suggesting that Peyes's piece or Rafael Lozano Hammer's piece are social art practices, they nonetheless establish a zone of contact between the social and the dispositif itself of cinema in this case. So let's, uh, let's view this. Thank 
Sí, como que se ponen un poco. 
Las leyes, las costumbres, les conceden el derecho de medir el espíritu. Esta jurisdicción soberana y terrible, ustedes la ejercen con su entendimiento. No nos hagan reír la credulidad de los pueblos civilizados, de los especialistas, de los gobernantes. Reviste la psiquiatría de inexplicables luces sobrenaturales. La profesión que ustedes ejercen está juzgada de antemano. No pensamos discutir aquí el valor de esa ciencia y la dudosa realidad de las enfermedades mentales. Pero por cada cien pretendidas patogenias, donde se desencadena la confusión de la materia y del espíritu, por cada cien clasificaciones donde las más vagas son también las únicas utilizables, ¿cuántas nobles tentativas se han hecho para acercarse al mundo cerebral en el que viven todos aquellos que ustedes han encerrado? ¿Cuántos de ustedes, por ejemplo, consideran que el sueño del demente precoz o las imágenes que lo acosan son algo más que una ensalada de palabras? No nos sorprende ver hasta qué punto ustedes están por debajo de una tarea para la que solo hay muy pocos predestinados. Pero nos rebelamos contra el derecho concedido a ciertos hombres, incapacitados o no, de dar por terminadas sus investigaciones en el campo del espíritu con un veredicto de encarcelamiento perpetuo. ¿Y qué encarcelamiento? Se sabe, nunca se sabrá lo suficiente, que los asilos, lejos de ser asilos, son cárceles horrendas, donde los recluidos proveen mano de obra gratuita y cómoda, y donde la brutalidad es norma. Ustedes toleran todo esto, el hospicio de alienados, bajo el amparo de la ciencia y de la justicia. Es comparable a los cuarteles, a las cárceles, a los penales. No nos referimos aquí a las internaciones arbitrarias para evitarle las molestias de un fácil desmentido. Afirmamos que gran parte de sus internados, completamente locos según la definición oficial, están también recluidos arbitrariamente. Y no podemos admitir que se impide el libre desenvolvimiento de un delirio tan legítimo y lógico como cualquier otra serie de ideas y de actos humanos. La represión de las reacciones antisociales es tan quimérica como inaceptable en principio. Todos los actos individuales son antisociales. Los locos son las víctimas individuales por excelencia de la dictadura social y en nombre de esa individualidad que es patrimonio del hombre, reclamamos la libertad de esos galeotes de la sensibilidad, ya que no está dentro de las facultades de la ley el condenar el cierro a todos aquellos que piensan y obran. Sin insistir en el carácter verdaderamente genial de las manifestaciones de ciertos locos, en la medida de nuestra actitud para estimarlas, afirmamos la legitimidad absoluta de su concepción de la realidad y de todos los actos que de ella derivan. Esperamos que mañana por la mañana a la hora de la visita médica, recuerden esto, cuando traten de conversar sin léxico con esos hombres sobre los cuales, reconozcanlo, solo tienen la superioridad que daba fuerza. So if, if, you, if you listen very carefully at the, at the text in the voiceover, we are almost listening to films that come from the 1970s from the particular anti-psychiatric anti movement and the anti-psychiatry films that Raymond de Pardon, for example, or uh, Marco, Marco Bellocchio were doing in the heydays of uh, uh, anti-psychiatric um, Uh, movements and attempts to uh, um, to uh, adopt measures um, and modify existing laws that deal with uh, treatment of psychiatric patients. You will also hear a very particular kind of film theory of the 1970s, namely dispositive or apparatus theory, in which, as in the case of this particular piece, where we have a grotto or a cave that is set up within the uh, context of, uh, of, of an arc event, creating a sort of atmosphere that, an atmosphere that is very much reminiscent of what some of the dispositive theorists were saying, which was that the cinematic experience or the cinematic dispositive itself, spectator, screen, is very much something that can be explored through the analogy with Plato's cave in which we are attached to, as prisoners, with fire in our back and projections onto a, a screen or a wall. 
in, in which shadows and illusions are being projected. What is happening in this particular kind of installation? What is happening in this particular kind of um, cinematic dispositive that is created through a particular kind of curatorial desire that attends to the psychotic, the incurable patient? Freud and then Lacan has spoken quite vividly about psychotic patients uh, as being incurable. See, I am trying to understand exactly why these images not only trouble the distinction between disciplinary societies and societies of control, not only remind us that all of the disciplinary institutions from psychiatric hospitals and so on continue to be the order of the day and continue to be the object of a form of care that the curator has, um, that the curator here as a capital C, obviously as a figure, has been entrusted to care for. What is the particular kind of alliance that takes place in, that, in this particular context? So Javier Teyes's piece is interesting. It's interesting because it creates all sorts of correspondences between 1970s dispositive theory and this particular kind of curatorial practice that I was talking about, but by avoiding some of the mistakes of social art practice. Yet, he also reproduces some of the typical gestures of social art practice in which here we have an artist who intervenes intervenes in such a way that he recruits mental patients and he recruits mental patients to participate, closing his piece with a theatrical event, bringing in the question of spectatorship, yet we are never really aware of the desire that produces this commission and this particular kind of intervention and performance. There's also something quite romantic in this particular piece. The native indigenous other is a source of authentic knowledge. The native other is created through an analogy with a psychotic patient, even more dangerous analogy. Almost secretly kind of uh, bringing in through the back door a sort of affinity between the primitive and the modern. Very dangerously creating an analogy that is very much a late 19th century Victorian analogy between the primitive and the mentally ill. There is this fascination in some of the images that, I see that, I sh that I've shown tonight, including the introductory uh, sequence to La Formula Secreta, with attempts to produce forms of subjectivity in which, just like in the case of psychotic patients, there is a radical resistance to any attempt to symbolize. There is almost something iconoclastic in the image of Eduardo Abaroa in destroying the muse museum of national, uh, national Museum of Anthropology. So here we begin to see that the malaise that these images seem to ail from is not only a curatorial malaise, but it is a malaise of an assemblage in which anthropology, art, and curation are very much enmeshed. So what we need to diagnose is are not subjects, and this is the conclusion, and I think I'm going to wrap up now. What we need to diagnose and, 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 and care for are assemblages of anthropology, art, and, and, and curation, rather than the subjects themselves. Because each time we bring in subjects, such as the psychotic patients of Javier Thies's installation, immediately are cut into the famous black mess of modernity that Michel Foucault talked about. We are here not only reproducing dangerous binaries, but we are also um, posing the wrong questions to address questions that in fact were raised in a different kind of um, order of things. What are the correspondences between La Formula Secreta in which a tube and a drain inoculates a body politic that is about to die? And Javier Teyes is going to Mexico City and working in a psychiatric hospital, collaborating, participating, essentializing the very notion of collaboration and, uh, and participation. See, what I'm suggesting here is not that the incurable is going to be answered tonight or even in this book that I'm finishing, that the incurable is a very problematic and sticky concept. It's almost like the pharmacon. It's both remedy and antidote. It's a double-edged sword. It is a source of fascination that is very much in need of being historicized. It is a form of desire that is very much part of a desired characteristic of disciplinary societies. 
the question that we should be asking from the standpoint of societies of control that continues to address questions of discipline in societies, we still have to deal, as we should, with the problem of mental illness, of the, man of the problem of uh, how to explain psychosis, of the problem of how to intervene. The nature of intervention itself, the nature of intervention becomes a radical act that unfortunately has to be treated with a great deal of care. And I think it's the notion of intervention that we are not attending to with the proper care. So what, 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 this, what this book and this, this you know, very, very short presentation does is just to tease a little bit curators with the idea of the curator, and this is the moment where you know, we should take this also with a little bit of humor, that the curators also have to be able to articulate for us not only their fascination for what is deemed and marked as incurable, as if it were an automatic thing that if we care for psychotic patients, if we care for vulnerable subjects, if we care for subjects that were um, the, um, uh, the object of, of violence or the object of disciplinary power, we need to understand how do these particular kind of alliances have created a form of care that now we accept as if it were an authentic truth. And curating, unfortunately, tends to reify this particular position. And what I like in particular in Eduardo Abaroa's um, destruction, of total destruction of the Museum of Anthropology, is that of course he's not interested in destroying the Museum of Anthropology. What he's trying to destroy is the idea of ethnography and anthropology, or the idea of social intervention that belongs to another form of society and that I think has not been yet addressed in what I call societies of curation. That the societies of curation in which we find ourselves need to really understand exactly how this assemblage of anthropology, art, and curation, in fact, is the mode of care that is brewing in these contemporary images, the mode of care of the future that is brewing in these images. And in, uh, what I find particularly interesting is how the cinematic, the cinematic as a form of uh, theatrical representation, the cinematic as a form of audience making, the cinematic as a form also of creating, I mean, Arthur's cave, the notion of cave here is, I mean, it's, it's textbook dispositive theory of the 1970s, which many of us have, you know, kind of turned our back to. The analogy between the movie theater, the dim lights, spectators sitting in the screening room, and the analogy with the cave or the analogy with the mother's womb, which is one of the other you know, analogies that were made in those years, are very problematic. And I think these pieces are very much reproducing those, those problems that were addressed about you know, 15 or 20 years ago. So we cannot take for granted this social for two reasons. First, the social has to be historicized. The social is something that belongs to disciplinary society. It's something that emerged in the 19th century. And we need to understand properly what are the mutations and the migrations of the concept of the social and how these migrations become translated in cinematic form. The social also has to be put in the context of the crisis of the welfare state. If the crisis of the welfare state has generated the figure of the curator as the new figure of care, as the new figure of welfare perhaps, we need to ask ourselves how did that happen? And thirdly, we have to ask ourselves how did anthropologists become complicit in this particular assemblage? This is what I find particularly interesting, and I will close with this, this thought, is that what Eduardo Abaroa is exploding in this particular text, uh, image, this particular kind of iconoclastic you know, desire to explode anthropology, is not anthropology, of course, but it's that particular understanding of anthropology that unfortunately has um, uh, created what we now call the curator as ethnographer. So all of this is something that has to be unpacked, and I think we have just begun to understand how this operates. Thank you. Any questions, please? Thank you. That was a, these are really amazing questions to ask and think about, but I don't have a question yet. I'm 
I'm reminded of a um, quote that Guattari wrote in one of his book about um, the fact that the patient is not someone who needs medication, but the doctor needs, uh, the doctor prescribes the medication to the patient because he will go mad if he doesn't prescribe the medication. So, you know, it's the actually the reverse. And I can see that all these examples that you uh, presented have something perverse about <laughs> it. Yes, but I'm, I'm still articulating my thoughts, but I was reminded of uh, Guattari's idea of, you know, the actually the doctor is mad. <laughs> and that's why the idea of prescribing, but you need the patient mm -hmm. to prescribe it too. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I got the, the phrase right. Do something. You know, Guattari also wrote a very interesting text in 1975 in an issue of communication, the Journal of Cinema, called The Poor Man's Couch, and it was a metaphor for cinema. And it was a moment in which he was very much attacking the figure of the analyst, right, of the, dom uh, the Lacanian analyst in particular. So cinema for Guattari was very much a form of treatment and a form of therapy, but not a form of psychoanalytical therapy that involved the analyst and the analyst in a session that is repeated twice or three times a week at $100 a session or $200, right? The cinematic here emerges as a figure as well in this particular kind of uh, uh, remaking of curatorial practice or the relationship between the curator and the artist in this particular case. But here there is always this ghostly and spectral figure of the patient as, of course, leveled out through you know, these words that have now become you know, fashionable, but that we, con st we should continue to cultivate, words like participation and, 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 and collaboration. So the nature, I, I am not debating whether this collaboration is genuine or not. This is not my job to do that. My job is to understand how this particular historical moment in which the welfare state is in crisis or has been completely dismantled, the new figure of the, the doctor, if you will, or the psychoanalyst, is the figure that we call the curator, a figure that etymologically invokes all of these registers, right? And uh, this is book one to just raise these questions. Um, but I, I, you know, thank you for, there was another question. Yes. Uh, your talk was very captivating. It's interesting uh, using the incurable, even linguistically through the talk as a sort of ongoing thing that keeps coming in and coming through, but is also not fully translatable, just like all the texts you're talking about. So just hearing your talk kind of had echoes of your project, which was really beautiful. Um, I'm really grateful that you're both raising and looking closely at the work of curators, but also reminding us that cura curation, even as a form of healing and, and bring bringing up polyphonic narratives and voices, is also uh, a play of power. Um, that we often forget, and it's really important to not negate both, but see how both kind of work with each other and how the artist and the viewer kind of get interpolated. So it's interesting that you're raising all of the above. Thank you. If, if, I, if I may add something to, to your comment, I don't know if you noticed, the, I hyphened the relationship between incurable and image. I, I have, you know, long text that I wanted to read, but I'd be very happy to share with you an article that's coming out soon on, on these issues. Um, the, relation, the hyphen here is, is, is a mode of relationship between the incurable and the image, right? But for me, the, the, the hyphen here is a mode of rupture, right? It's, it's a mode of rupture, but it's also a mode of repetition. Do we repeat the specific relationship between the incurable subject and the doctor, right? and then it becomes just a repetition of the same? Or do we invent a new way of relating the incurable to the image? But then in that case, we would not have images such as Ruben Gámez's La Formula Secreta, where the, dis the medical dispositive is clearly announced, enunciated, clearly performed. But I think th there is something perverse, not only in these works, but in my own way of curating these works, right? So this is also a curatorial project as well. And, and I like this, the idea of toying with the, with, 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 um, uh, with the provocation that there are various forms of curation. And that the 
professional curators form of curation is only one curation among others. Right? But I didn't talk enough about ethics, and perhaps you know, questions will raise that, that question. For me, these images are, they address really an intellectual difficulty, an intellectual difficulty with ethnography as an anthropologist, an anthropologist who doesn't work with subjects, an anthropologist who works with assemblages, I just outlined the assemblage that I worked with, and a difficulty about, you know, I, most of my friends are curators and my interlocutors, yet their work does invoke the incurable but does not humble itself in the face of the incurable, if you will. So it, it's, it, it'll always be a, 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 a doubled relationship. All of the images that you showed um, really related to um, issues that can be very difficult to handle, issues of crisis, and I'm wondering if you might talk about um, art as a way of dealing with um, national trauma as opposed to other ways of dealing it through writing or policy change. What does art do that is specifically helpful and it does the artist and the curator have a responsibility to try and um, fix things? takes us into the threshold between ethics and, and moralism, right? Uh, or morality, right? Um, and trauma is a very particular register as well. Um, I'm, I'm not going to answer your question directly. I'm, I, I will just perhaps give an example that I didn't have the opportunity to, to, to talk about, and this is probably going to be the cover, <laughs> the book cover. Uh, this is the work of um, of uh, Mexico City um, Mexican artist Eric Nuremberg, who uh, who has been working on the uh, on um, on the racial topology uh, in Mexican history, uh, criollos, whites, Indians, uh, and blacks. Uh, and of course, there's the mestizo category, which is the syn you know the, the the cultural hybrid category that synthesizes all of these different racial uh, categories into this you know raza cosmica that uh, Vasconcelos talks about in the 1920s. So what he does is very interesting. He he um, he uses um, racial mixtures from the 17th century. All sorts of racial mixtures, right? There are hundreds of them. 5% black with 95% uh, uh, mestizo, and then you have the category that results from that. And he creates this you know, immersive installation with LED rings, suspended LED rings. And this is done in Laboratorio Alameda, which is really a beautiful space in Mexico City, but you know, within this Baroque architecture, referencing the, s the 16th and 17th century in Mexico. And he used RG the RGB system, right? Red, green, and blue, right? that is generated by these LED, uh, LED lights. And they're programmed in such a way that when they are um, used at the same time, the same space, with the same intensity, they produce just white. So it moves from white to black with all sorts of uh, hues in between. And then you have these, these images that result. But he doesn't use just the racial mixtures from the 17th century. He also uses a, a contemporary project by the Mexican Genome Project which has attempted to classify <coughs> the Mexican genome. And he compares the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the racial mixtures of 17th century with the attempt to biopoliticize the contemporary Mexican through this genetic experimentation. And he compares these two particular um, uh, uh, cartographies of, uh, of the genetic makeup And he goes on to read the fantasies of the 1920s and the 1930s by nationalist intellectuals who thought that post-revolutionary -re Mexico was to, was to bring in this unified race, right, that would hybridize and then synthesize all of these different racial um, uh, profiles into this you know, subject set citizen, the new man, right, of, of the Mexican Revolution. And then he, he has this very interesting installation that results in 
you know, um, a, an interesting relationship between the historical, which the building represents to a certain extent, and you know, what I had referred to initially in this talk as the Nietzschean non-historical cloud, something that is, in fact, showing that there are incredible contradictions between the project of mestizaje, so cultural hybridism, and then the project of mapping the, me the contemporary Mexican genome project. I think what is at stake here is beyond, I mean, beyond the question of trauma, is the question of, I mean, the concept of life itself is at stake here. And the concept of life here is being reformulated in such a way that these forms of curation are trying to pose the very basic question, in my view, what form of life does art generate? What kind of form of life does uh, Eric's uh, Etude Taxonomique, and it's a long title, I can read it, you know, freely. Etude Taxonomique et Comparative entre les Castes de la Nouvelle Espagne et celles du Mexique Contemporain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's this, to me, the, it, it, the question is really a relation between the historical and the contemporary. It's, 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 to also it's a relationship between the dis disciplinary societies and societies of control. It's a relationship between um, um, fabulations, if you will, or desires and fantasies of the avant-garde of the 1920s and 30s in Mexico to invent this new man, and then realize that this new man, that the Mexican of anthropology, that the, the, the National Museum of Anthropology was supposed to host, is in fact just a pile of debris. And I, I am interested in this, in this moment of collapse. I'm interested in this moment in which the incurable appears to us as one of the most difficult challenge that we have to face. And I think in, 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 in my humble way, I go back to a very, very basic, you know, I think, answer. It's really artists who are doing the work here. No better image of the, of the disaster that Mexico is going through is than, than this picture, or than this particular picture. And this is a more hopeful image of the future. B but yet, the crisis, if there is a crisis, is the crisis of nationalism. It's the, cri the crisis of nationalist categories and nationalist identities. But it's also a crisis of the very idea of how cosmopolitan desire also has generated profoundly nationalist categories. This is the crisis of the avant-garde in Mexico. And anthropology is a major player in that context. And it's very interesting, again, speaking of you know, an anthropology that zooms in on assemblages and not on people. I am very clear about that. You will see that the assemblage from the 1920s and 30s, which is exactly the same assemblage, anthropology. Manuel Gamio, a famous Mexican anthropologist, wrote a, a book called Forjando Patria, Forging Motherland, right? which this piece references. That project is bankrupt. Mestizaje is a bankrupt project. So what these artists are doing they are not trying to be anthropologists in the sense that Abarua wants to destroy anthropology, in the sense that I am not an, that kind of anthropologist. It's to really remake and reassemble that particular relationship. I mean, that's my, my answer. A and, and, and to me, the trauma, is pr the trauma comes from that assemblage, from those nationalist desires. La Formula Secreta is the same thing, 1965 already. It's, a harp it's almost a virtual image in the sense of Deleuze. La Formula Secreta is already uh, ushering this particular kind of image. The, the vulture that's gliding over the, 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 the Tsokalo is a vulture that's gliding over something that's dying. And, and what's dying is Mestizaje. What's dying is the figure of the new man. What's dying is the role of anthropology and the responsibility to create a national identity as well. So we, we, we I think the time now is to pause, endure a little bit, and and then try to again as you know the best artists do <laughs> create f you know challenging forms and challenging concepts and, and this is what i find very useful in these in these particular works it definitely helped me think of the kind of anthropologist i do not want to be or the kind of film curator i don't want to be either so it's this is the ethical moment where these images become begin to be the, be the become the point of departure for a, a new form of ethical you know subjectivation and, and inquiry into these images so that's why the, the book is, is clearly called lessons from mexico we, we are in a very very 
dangerous moment in many ways. And I think these images can help us in a rethink some of these categories. Thank you, Tarek, uh, for that incredibly provocative uh, presentation. I'm still digesting it, thinking about the assemblages. And um, I think that, I mean, in terms of being able to probe some of what we've seen, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting combination. It's very relevant uh, for for thinking at this moment uh, to consider how this configuration of artists, anthropologists, and curators uh, is being thought. And I think that it will probably uh, take time to tease this out uh, in terms of uh, uh, the variations of how that configuration can be thought now, uh, and I'm and I am curious about um, what what kinds of uh, trajectories are going to come from thinking about that, and as well as uh, indications of what you can imagine. Um, you invoke the idea of the future, and um, I'm curious about that. Uh, in your in your configuration, if there's anything you can say about that, maybe as a closing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I think that the the um, I think the question of what is contemporary art, what is contemporary anthropology, what is contemporary philosophy is a relevant question that needs to be posed in ontological terms. I think one way of answering those questions, and the question that I can answer is what is contemporary anthropology? And what is a contemporary anthropology from the perspective of a film curator? Is how can we shift our focus from subject-oriented research to assemblage-oriented research for a moment? In other words, what would be the stakes and the risks, and there are many risks in doing that gesture, in not filling the void of the figure of the public intellectual by the figure of the curator, a certain kind of curator, opportunistic curators, not to fill the void of the crisis of the welfare state by social oriented practices or social practices, not to fill the void of the crisis in the university, at least the university where I come from, by um, re forms of research that are too quick and too uh, superficial. I think it's a question of pedagogy, but not a pedag form of pedagogy that will become reified of another turn. So I think in the end it would be, how do we reconcile the ethnographic turn with the pedagogical turn? Um, um, in such a way that we reshuffle the cards <laughs> Uh, and uh, and invent new forms of curation, uh, and, and by and, and by being confident that and, and again you know not uh, starting a war with curators as I said many of my friends are curators, but we have to think very seriously about shifting our register from critical categories and all the binaries that they have produced, the black modes, and to think about what it would mean to think clinically, what forms of diagnosis are at stake. So I would say that. A diagnostic form of research that shifts its interest from subject-oriented to assemblage-oriented forms of research would be one way of looking at it. And I don't think I can think beyond that now. It's, it's and because some, it's for the very simple reason that um, the question is not who can speak and who cannot speak. It's what assemblage can teach us as a way of initiating new, f new forms of ethical inquiry. So the ethical here is very important for me. Um, 
but the ethical is um, is a minefield as well. Um, so I, I, I would say that um, care, <laughs> what forms of care are at stake in these particular processes, and this shift from subject-oriented to assemblage-oriented has to be a guilt-free shift. In other words, I, I sense that there is a great deal of, because the word responsibility is very important, you know, to go back to your question. It's, it's duty, responsibility. These are highly moral uh, categories. And, and I think for a moment we have to pause and precisely produce new concepts. I mean, to me, it's, it, it's, it, it's at the level of the concept and, 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 and uh, that this new conversation can take place. And curation is the concept that is in serious crisis. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for this presentation. We'll be continuing the seminar tomorrow. And uh, thank you everyone for attending and I look forward to seeing you back on December 9th uh, when we have as our last uh, presentation, uh, Joan Jonas uh, and uh, Reanimation is her title. And so look forward to seeing you then. Good night. <laughs>